you consider yourself a high achiever, smart, driven, highly successful? I am so excited to have you. My name is Julia Arndt and I'm the host of the Stress Podcast. I will help you develop your stress resilience the same way you've developed your workplace superpowers. Learn peak performance tools to thrive at work and in your personal life. Let's get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Stress Podcast. I am super excited to welcome our next podcast guest to the show today, and it is Michelle Purcell. Hi, Michelle. How are you today? I'm great, Julia. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, it's my pleasure. I love your background. You look like you're sitting in an official boss chair, which I love. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I'm super excited to talk with you today about your work. And before we jump into all of the different things that you're doing, I would love to ask you three very simple questions that I ask every podcast guest on the show. And they are, what time is it? Where are you located? And what have you been up to today? Hmm. Okay. So it's a little after four, my time, which is central time zone, uh, Chicago time zone. And, but I'm in Wisconsin and um, enjoying the fall weather here. Uh, today has been a mix of getting things out for World Mental Health Day. Um, so uh, there was work on an email and I um, actually have a new program out to support people with their emotional well-being that I was working on. Uh, and then I snuck in a few, well, a few minutes, maybe an hour to garden, which is always um, just, I, I try to take not just a lunch break, but just some time to enjoy my day. So that was, that was my little uh, reflection time in the garden while I still have a garden here in Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so nice. That's, that sounds super lovely. Michelle, tell us a little bit more about you, what you do and where, where you came from that you are, where, what you're doing today. Like, you know, what, where, what was the journey? Oh God, my, my English today. <laughs> You can tell me it's my first uh, interview actually today and the first time that I'm actually speaking um, to anyone because I've been just sitting in front of my computer today. So I just have to get a little bit into the, the swing of things. So let me ask this question one more time. Um, how did you kind of get into the work that you're doing today? Tell us a little bit more about your journey. Sure. And, and just so you know, I was, I was following you anyways. It's, it's quite all right. <laughs> uh, so my background is a psychotherapist. Um, I received my training in clinical psychology, oh gosh, probably a couple decades ago. And um, I knew right away that a uh, traditional path uh, in terms of my work probably was not going to be the best fit for me. What I was experiencing, even in the beginning of my clinical uh, psychology program, was this realization that, okay, therapy is obviously a very helpful tool. It's very powerful uh, when we're experiencing mental health challenges. What for me in particular, and I identify as an emotionally sensitive person, what I was finding was, okay, I've got all these tools to support me to get rid of my negative feelings. The issue is being emotionally sensitive, my negative feelings keep coming back and I would experience them um, pretty readily. And so um, I, I decided then that I needed additional training besides traditional clinical um, psychology and was really combining at the same time Uh, life coaching. Now, back in my day, uh, life coaching was this new thing. Um, when I would tell people I was a coach, they thought like I was um, like a basketball coach or something like that. <laughs> so, um, so, but it was really integrating some of uh, just these, these life Uh, lessons that were not not really taught, uh, along with some spiritual aspects um, that I found helpful, that was very grounding for me while I was also getting uh, my degree in clinical psychology. And so um, 
this was great. I, I had all these practices then to, um, you know, for self-care and meditation, um, along with these psychological tools um, to support uh, mental and emotional health. Um, so things seem to be going great, except for the fact, again, um, my negative feelings kept coming back. And so I, 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 received my degree. I got, I started a private practice and I felt like a fraud doing what I was doing because here I was trying to help people with their mental health, but I still could not, um, really understand why do we feel the way that we do? It, it didn't make sense to me. And, um, and so I just felt like I can't do this. I can't go out there and, and help people with their, their mental health if I'm still struggling. And so that's when I was like, forget it. I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, <laughs> but I'm not doing this. And um, I had this like freak out, you know, ugly cry, dark night of the soul, all of it. And, um, and said, I, I, I just can't keep um, trying to do this if I can't get this for myself. That night, um, I woke up around 4 a.m. And that is when I started to receive um, some guidance is maybe a way to put it around um, why we do feel the way that we do. And so for, uh, for nine months straight, I was woken up every day at 4.30 in the morning um, telling me to get up, go to my computer, write, and I would just write whatever came through and it was all guidance regarding um, our emotional health and really understanding our emotional well-being. So if this just sounds really odd to people, let me just break this down just really quickly. We all have that voice that says, oh, shoot, you forgot to call your mom and you told her you would or, oh, shoot, did I lock my door? You know, we have this voice Mm -hmm. And mine was just telling me to go to the computer and write. And so, you know, um, and that's the best way I can, can normalize this. But I think, you know, we all get into certain times in our life where we, we get downloads or flow moments. Mine happened to be at 4.30 in the morning because I had very young children. I had my, my children, um, I had my daughter and then uh, twin boys, 18 months apart. So I think the only time I had for this download was at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> so that's that's it in a nutshell, uh, Julia. And I could speak more to where it, it, it is today, but that's kind of the background. Okay. Yeah, I love that. That's super helpful and so interesting. And one of the thoughts that I had right away was it must have been really groundbreaking at the time to actually kind of combine coaching with counseling and therapy because coaching today is so widely known and there's so many coaches out there doing so many different things but you know I think you mentioned in our kind of free conversation that it was like 15 20 years ago when you started kind of your coaching slash counseling therapy practice and so that was a long long time ago how did you hear about life coaching I'm kind of curious Oh gosh, I'm trying to remember exactly how I heard about it. I was always on an alternative path. Mm -hmm. um, I was seeing shamans before, you know, shamans became a thing. <laughs> um, so somewhere, you know, in that alternative world, um, I was uh, con I was connected with someone. Oh, I know who it was. Uh, I don't know if people remember Sonia Choquette. Um, but she, I'm originally from Chicago and she was doing a training in Chicago and I connected with some women, um, who were also kind of on this path to, um, to life coaching and, um, and connected me with someone who just started off with, uh, training. And so I, I became interested because, um, it, it was again. It was important that I had all the 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 background um, in terms of psychology and understanding these different frameworks and um, systems when it comes to individual mental health uh, and how we relate to one another within our work relationships as a couple and so forth. Um, but uh, 
it's it doesn't mean that we're going to be happy. And I think where I was really coming from are what are some of the keys that will lead me um, in terms of mental frameworks that would support uh, greater happiness. And um, and and that was a great path uh, for me. So yeah, yeah, interesting. Okay, so a million questions for you in my head. <laughs> and maybe I'll try and ask one after the other. The first one is, so what did you decide to do then, right? So you wrote this, you wrote all of these things down. Did that beca become a book eventually? It did. It was my first book. Um, I never planned on writing a book. Uh, I, I was about five months into being woken up at 4.30 in the morning. And I was like, oh, I think I've got a book here. Mm -hmm. And um, really, yes, it, it was my first book, but I think it was really the the download of the core of what I would end up teaching and refining throughout the years. And um, so the book is, is old <laughs> as many years ago. And, um, you know, since then it's been a, an experience of refining with people and working with people from all over the world and really all sectors of, of people and whether they're, um, C-level executives, people in sales, people who are struggling with welfare, um, stay-at-home parents, it, it really having the spectrum. And from people all over um, the world uh, in teaching them, um, because eventually this led to uh, me doing a certification program where I, where I began teaching other therapists and life coaches uh, the emotional empowerment modality, which is what this work, the, my body of work is now referred to today as, as the emotional empowerment process. Okay. And is that the name of the book as well? Uh, the first book is, um, you can probably see this little yellow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's it. It's emotional abundance become empowered. So I, I had the framework of empowerment in there, but it wasn't quite, uh, the tight title that it, that it became. So, okay. Okay. And, um, so what, what answers did you find to the question of how can I manage these negative emotions that keep coming back? For me, it was really um, recognizing that each specific emotion has a feeling. And this is where a, a part of the body of my work that I teach is um, how we can start to relate to our emotions differently. How we are taught to relate to our emotions can really put us in, into some vicious cycles. Um, so, so if I go off the if, if I go off the question, you can oh, just bring it back. I think it's really interesting. I think it's it's cool to go a little deeper and really understand this because I think a lot of quest, a lot of people would like to understand that too. Okay, so yeah, one of the first things that that I I want people to look at or invite them to look at is some of these vicious cycles that we can find ourselves in. Um, and and really, to me, I think part of the problem where why so many people are struggling today is because we're we've been taught so much how to manage our emotions rather than actually process our emotions and so a lot of the corporate training that i'm going into today is saying you know they want to hire me to say michelle you know our emotions are all over the board at work people's emotions are coming out sideways how can we better manage them and i'm saying you don't want to manage them better. <laughs> we have so much that we're trying to manage. Um, let me give you some ways where you can start to process the fe your feelings. And, and so really we start to look at, look at some of the vicious cycles that we're in, in terms of our relationship with our emotions. The first one is we deny. Um, and we, when we deny our emotions, then we're turning to coping mechanisms um, to, you know, so that we don't have to deal with the uncomfortable feeling coping mechanisms. Some can be healthy. Some can be unhealthy. Um, the more unhealthier they are, the worse we're going to feel, um, that depletes our energy. So when we're, when we deny our emotions there, we, our life force energy is actually internally pushing down these emotions. So when people say that they're they're burnt out and depleted, a part of it is, is that they're trying to contain um, 
these emotions that they're experiencing. So, you know, I've gone in in corporations and have done group training, uh, I'm sorry, group, group coaching. And, you know, these people, a lot of the employees and, and again, high level executives and managers, they don't want to say how depleted they are. But what happens is, is that so much of their internal energy is, again, pushing that down, that it adds to, the, to their depletion. So sometimes just giving voice to this is incredibly powerful. Um, so sorry, I'm going off on a tangent on this. But anyways, the more we, we push down these emotions, um, the more likely we're actually setting ourselves up to feel more uncomfortable um, emotions. And so we get in this cycle. So that's the, one of the most common vicious cycles. The second one is where we're, we're reactionary, right? So we experience a negative feeling, we react. I, that's where I call our emotions coming out sideways. They come out in a way where we really, um, you know, it feels out of alignment with who we really are. Uh, it doesn't feel in integrity. Again, we're going to turn to coping mechanisms because we're trying to cover up that shame that we feel. Um, that takes more energy to cope and deny the shame. Um, and again, we're setting ourselves up to experience more and more uncomfortable emotions. The third one, which I think is interesting because um, I think it's a, where a lot of people are at um, because they haven't been taught a way to process their emotions is they, they have awareness around their emotions. They may even say to themselves like, okay, this emotional experience will only last, you know, a few seconds and, you know, here's some healthier things that I could be doing instead, or here's a healthier mindset that I can have instead. And so they move forward mentally, but emotionally, uh, that emotion is not processed. So what happens is we're moving forward mentally, like I've got this, you know, here's my positive mindset. But we, that emotional weight is still there because we haven't taken in that, that emotion is providing us with specific information regarding this circumstance. And so they, they try to move forward, but they're still feeling somewhat depleted because that emotion isn't processed. And then they find themselves they're overall, they can feel, you know, better um, than someone who's turning to like unhealthy, unhealthy coping. Um, but they, they'll find themselves stuck in certain areas of their life. Like, wow, I'm really great at my career, but relationships, I seem to get stuck over here. Or, um, you know, I'm really good with relationships, but I'm, I find myself in the, in a cycle where with money or with time management or whatever it is. And it's because we're never getting to the root of the emotion, which is trying to help us get to the root of the shame so that we can move forward more freely. And so, um, this is what I'm really getting, helping people get to the core of is within each emotion, um, how to process it and with deeper feelings, how to get to the shame so we can move forward more freely. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So I assume that you still have negative emotions uh, regularly, but do you feel like you just have found a better way to process it and to accept? It, it sounds like there's a lot of acceptance and just kind of moving and feeling these emotions process that really helps you to to just kind of let go of maybe those uncomfortable feelings of feeling negative emotions yes i would say um i do still experience negative feelings and the reason is is because as long as we're alive hopefully we are experiencing negative emotions because um think about it like um maybe people in your audience have heard how when we're on an airplane, like I think it's 98 or 99% of the time we're off course. <laughs> so when we're on auto, the, the plane's flying on autopilot, 99% of the time we're off course, it's get the, the airplane is getting signals about how to get stay on course. So depending on the circumstances, the wind, I don't know if there's a bird or the weather or whatever it is, it's it's recalculating um, to support the plane to get to the de destination, the easiest, the fastest, et cetera. It's the same for us with our emotions. They're kind, we, we have, um, according to uh, emotional intelligence research, 
27 dif different emotional reactions every hour per so per day that equates to around 432 different emotions that we're experiencing now most people don't um, recognize that we're experiencing that many emotions because they're part of our subconscious programming we are our conscious mind our thinking mind is operating some people say five to ten percent some people say it's less than five percent that we're using our conscious thinking rational thinking mind and a lot of times we're operating on these programs so our emotions are a part of these programs and so when we're operating subconsciously we're taking in this information that our conscious mind isn't even aware of so that's why our emotions are influencing us even when we're not like stating to ourselves like whoa i'm sad or whoa i'm really angry or i feel really anxious those signals have been coming in long before we're, we're actually even recognizing them and so this is where i share to all my emotionally sensitive people um that's a gift because what that means is, is that you can start course correcting what these signals are telling you um, before um, others who may not be as sensitive. And then that becomes your superpower because it brings you into greater awareness. So yes, I, I, I am like everybody else. I continue to receive um, a, a mixture of emotions. I always, my relationship to my emotions is where I'm always trying to receive them. So it's, I, I, acceptance, I, I, I hesitate with that word because I feel like some people are like, okay, I'm just going to accept how I feel. But then again, they just, um, which is good rather than deny it, right? Or be reactionary. But I feel like they're just left to sit in that and it's uncomfortable and it's not empowering. So yes, so it's more about receiving it. And then what is this signal telling me? Um, and then taking the empowered guidance to shift our experience because the empowered guidance through each, you know, there's a reason why we experience different feelings and each has specific guidance supporting us to show up more in our truth supporting us to show up more in our authenticity, our power, our self-confidence. So um, they're guiding us to grow. And as long as we're here, hopefully we're growing. Interesting. So interesting. Yeah, very, very cool. And so when you are working with corporate teams, and I know you usually do more than just one workshop as well in order to kind of really work through these different steps, can you give us more of a high level overview of what that would look like you know, would it be three sessions, six sessions, and kind of what what do you address in these different sessions then with regards to managing, not even managing your emotions? Well, we just learned that process. <laughs> That's right, Julia. No more managing. No more managing. Okay. Yeah, no, processing our emotions. Yeah. So um, like for leadership training, it's usually in three parts. Part number one is emotional empowerment 101 like this is your training on emotions that we never had that we all need part two is <clears throat> understanding your emotions as a leader so i'm not going to teach leaders to be empathetic towards their team if they don't understand how to if they don't understand their own relationship with their emotions mm -hmm. so I, I i think that's a little surfacey if we say hey i'm going to give you training that's going to make you you know create better psychological safety and empathy and it's all about your team and not about you and so it's really addressing um one's own relationship with their emotions understanding some of their emotional blind spots and working through some of their own challenges um, so they can see that their empowered emotions are actually working for them. And that's when I really get my leaders um, really excited about this, because when they see when when we apply it to a, a challenge that they're have, having and they have a breakthrough, they're like, OK, this this works. Then part three is how do we apply this to your team um, mm -hmm. where you can really start to understand what might be going on for team members? Um, don't, you know, really making sure that you're not dancing around emotions, how you can get to the undertone of what's happening. 
and 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 influence the situation because every person is responsible for their own emotional um selves and so um but how how you can support someone if they are emotionally triggered but again everyone's emotional trigger is their own responsibility the emotion is happening within them so um that's where we're really helping people differentiate that and know what to do when that happens uh, again it, whether it's for themselves individually or within their team mm -hmm. this is so interesting and i think one question that people oftentimes ask themselves in that regard is is a manager even responsible for even addressing that in their reportees because as you are saying right everybody is responsible for their own emotions and triggers and they have their own histories of why they might react the way they do um, can you share some thoughts on that? Because I'm sure a lot of people think, well, should like I, I get this question all the time, or I have these discussions all the time where people are like, should I really be responsible as a manager? Shouldn't we have other programs within the company, right? Or um, should I just not send them to a therapist or recommend them to do therapy? Or you know, what what is really your responsibility as a manager? Yeah, I, I I think responsibility is is interesting word, right? Because ultimately that's up to your leadership style. I think when you understand that when someone has um, emotional triggers coming out, um, and if you feel it's your responsibility as a manager um, regarding communication, productivity, um, and the culture of your team, if that if you take those aspects as serious as a part of your responsibility, then yes, you're going to want to address the emotional undertones happening because um, studies have shown there is emotional companion within teams, which means emotions spread and negative emotions spread. And so we really come in to support managers to understand that it's well we will get dissatisfied um employees if we don't have the leadership skills to know how to address these undertones because they just fester mm -hmm. and so um you know especially when we're in climates where um you know people have a lot of say with where they work um this is this is integral to retention because managers um, are often the reason why employees cite that they quit their job. And they, if they don't feel that their manager, it could be a personal th you know, issue, but if they don't feel that they can trust their manager to lead and lead their team effectively, um, a lot of this is their inability um, to address uh, the undertones that are happening that are impacting, um, again, communication, productivity, um, and, and culture and connection within the team. So um, it's interesting because I would say that that's an old school mentality um, before the pandemic, right? Where we're like, <laughs> emotions don't belong at work. You know, here's a program or here's a therapist recommendation. And what we're going to see for leaders and managers is that these so you know so-called soft skills are going to be what really set you apart in your leadership ability and creating this level of um, psychological safety within your team um, really supports you and your growth as as a leader um so i i just think it's going to be more and more imperative yeah i couldn't agree more i think it's so important and you know one of the ways i'm already thinking is is that you just need to educate everyone as well i think if the team is on the same level and they would at least get like, you know, an introduction to how to process emotions, then you can have very different conversations as well with team members. Then if you just have that knowledge and you kind of have to bring it, you know, kind of break it down to employee levels, um, it's going to be much harder to get that trust and to get that understanding than if you would have someone external come and speak about this. So yeah, I think that's, so important work and so interesting. So yeah, I'm I'm very, very happy we have you on the podcast today. Oh, thank you. And, and I'll just speak really briefly to that is that we've seen both. Mm -hmm. I've gone in and just trained leadership teams um, 
leaders, even if they didn't have their team members um, experience, experience the training, um, leaders have shared that they received um, a 50% impact on emotional burnout within their team just from the training and how they show up as a leader. It's reduce, reducing emotional overwhelm and burnout. Um, of course, when we get, when, when my organization comes in and does employee wide training, um, that's when we're really seeing a significant difference because we've got leaders who are embodying this and, and bringing this forward. And then the employees um, are just making complete turnarounds in their communications in con you know, conflict resolution, um, and, and, and really a sense of cohesiveness, um, between, um, one another. So, um, leaders have more of an impact. Managers have more of an impact than they realize. So, but yes, it, having a common language always makes it easier for sure. Yeah, for sure. I understand understand that yeah so um you were mentioning a certification earlier well actually before we got get to the certification that i'm curious about what you teach there is um you know you were saying which i found super interesting and i have never heard this before actually that we have about 24 emotion emotions per hour 27 on and average 27 emotions per hour and then 432 emotions per day so if we're right, because if we get eight hours of sleep, that leaves us with 432. And, and for many people who don't get the eight hours of sleep that they need, they're probably crankier <laughs> and you're awake more. So you're having more emotions. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Very interesting. And do you know if there is a difference between male and female? Do men, emo men oh. use as many emotions as women? <laughs> I, I, this is on average for both, um, women and men now, based on how I understand our emotions work again, we're receiving the signals, whether you're aware of it or not. So what you may be speaking to is, you know, it, um, you know, where it, the, um, a lot of women will say, I, I, I'm aware of a hundred emotions an hour. And, and sometimes we'll, men will say, well, I, I don't know, like five, maybe. <laughs> so, um, so we kind of have these stereotypes, but again, I think it depends on just how we're built. Some of us are more cognitively focused and, and that is obviously a great gift. Some of us have that deeper emotional connection. Um, I know for myself growing up, that was seen as a weakness um, but, uh, this really can become, um, your secret sauce to again, leadership, to connecting with others and to really understanding what's going on for others. And that's what I love about this because, um, I've done this training before with, with people in sales and sales tend to often be men and really helping them understand that the more that they have they're able to connect with this, the more they're able to connect with the, the potential fears of what is going on for uh, potential cl uh, clients and customers on the other side. And so they're aware, but I think there's also so there, you know, there's different experiences as how we grow up as, as, you know, being a, a man or male and a, and a female and how we're conditioned and how we're, you know, to what we're taught to pay attention to and what we're not. So um, I, I, in my private practice have worked with super successful people, people that um, some have deemed as scary uh, quote unquote, but are actually very emotionally sensitive and they've learned to hide it um, in different ways in order to, you know, come off as successful. So um, that's my long story of saying, I think we're equally experiencing that. Again, how we process information, some of us, you know, um, man or woman, um, uh, we might lean towards more cognitive framework versus an emotional framework, but um, those signals are still coming forward. Yeah, we're all human beings for sure. Yeah. Okay, so tell us a little bit more about your certification that you do nowadays, because what I understand is now you work more in that regard, right? You don't really work with individuals, you work more with organizations and teams, and then you also do the certification work. 
Yes. So the certification work is actually um, something that uh, is is closed right now as I'm I'm focusing more on um, uh, more on corporate training. There's a wait list right now. Where, so we're there's a potential for it to reopen. Um, but back in 2015 was when um, I really started getting people requesting hey, Michelle, can is there a way that you can train me on this? So it was either um, life coaches who uh, felt like they had a lot of um, training in terms of uh, mental programs and what's the mindset that they can work on. But when it came to emotions, they weren't sure what to do with their clients. Mm -hmm. I'd also get therapists who would say, you know, Michelle, even though I got my degree in clinical psychology, even though I'm a therapist, um, you know, I still struggle with my anxiety or, you know, I, I have some anger that I haven't dealt with. And so they wanted to experience the process so that they had more tools um, to address what was going on within them and then apply it to their clients or patients. Um, so um, that started in 2015. Since then, uh, we've trained people um, all over the world, um, you know, U.S., Canada, um, Denmark, um, Iceland, uh, China, all over. And, um, you know, it's been really exciting to see that, again, no matter where we're from or what our background yeah. is, like emotions, it's a universal language. Yeah. Um, and when we learn how to work with these emotions, um, it, it can really apply to everybody. That's so, so true. And um, to kind of wrap this up for today, if you know we're not an organization listening to this podcast right now, we're obviously an individual, and maybe we are, or the person you know who you who are listening right now, maybe you are experiencing these negative emotions. So, what would you tell people? Is maybe the first one, two, three steps that they can do in order to really tackle the anxiety that they're still experiencing, or the anger, or the you know maybe negative emotions. What would be the first few steps that they can take? Yeah, I would say, first of all, you know, be compassionate with yourself. Um, it, it, it's very challenging um, as these emotions arise or if they're continuing to arise um, that <laughs> we have to bring that that self-love to ourselves. that there's nothing wrong with you. Um, you're not broken. Um, in fact, I would argue that there's something very right with you and that your emotions are working for you. And I also want to, uh, you know, acknowledge that that could be difficult to hear. I've worked with a lot of people who um, have come to me as a last resource. You know, they were on psychotropic meds and they were having too many side effects with that. Um, they, you know, they tried therapy, they tried, um, you know, so many different things and nothing was working for them. And so to hear that your emotions are actually supporting you, they would get mad at me <laughs> and say, Michelle, how can you say that to me? And I would say, I get it. But a part of the issue is, and again, I, I, I've worked with people, um, you know, after, um, after uh, a, a suicidal attempt. And I say the same thing, your emotions are working for you. What's happening is we're, is that you've been trained to fight these feelings and um, you're getting so exhausted doing that. And so even at this place of exhaustion, depletion, burnout, that's actually a great place to be because it, not it's not a great place to be it's a, a a place to be where it offers an opportunity to be willing to do something vastly different is what i'll say it's not a great place to be i didn't uh, mean <laughs> mean it in that sense but it's an opportunity to do something very different than we're accustomed to and um and so it, it and it's not your fault you know we as a society have not been taught how to utilize our emotions as allies. Um, we have not been taught that they are here to support us. So we've done what has been shown to us, um, you know, by adults in our life. And so, you know, the big joke has been for many years of like moms with a glass of wine that, you know, fills up a whole bottle of wine. Like, 
you know, we kind of laugh at that, but the reality is like, that's how we are being modeled to cope with negative emotions, which is not at all helpful. So um, it's not your fault. And then, you know, what would it be like to just, um, you know, start to uh, be curious about receiving our negative feelings as a signal, a signal that, hey, I, I am not having a psychological need that's it's not being met right now mm -hmm. and can i start to get curious about what that psychological need might be um and what is my story around it not being met and so um a lot of times um you know our emotions how i teach emotions is first of all there's a signal Second of all, so a signal is simply, um, you know, green light. It's a, it's a keep doing what you're doing. We've got green light emotions. We're happy with, you know, things are working. Um, we're feeling excited, whatever. Yellow light emotions are kind of those um, emotions giving us a warning. Like, oh, I'm starting to feel frustrated. I'm starting to feel off. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm starting to, you know, dread something. They're, these are kind of warning light emotions. And that's an opportunity to really check in before things get heightened. Um, that's where you want to, you know, give yourself a few minutes um, to say, you know, what is the psychological need that I might be having in this moment? And what's the story I have about not being able to have that need met when it gets to red light emotions, when it gets to our emotions, just feeling, you know, the intensity is a eight, nine or 10. That's when we are really called to, um, take a step back. And you're not just doing this for yourself. You're doing it for everybody around you because we're, you know, that again, that energy is contagious. And so uh, we want to uh, take a step back and really start to look at why is this emotion trying to stop me? Mm -hmm. And we have so much judgment about being stopped, but I always tell people we're better off um, you know, taking that step back so we can take two steps forward. But what happens is, is because we've been taught to judge our emotions, we treat, we keep trying to push forward and push and make ourselves move forward and pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and keep going and keep going. And you start to feel like life is on a hamster wheel. So if we're, if you're feeling that way, that's your opportunity to say, this hamster wheel is not working for me. I'm better off stopping. And I'm going to stop and I'm going to, to write down, okay, what am I feeling? And then what are the stories? Again, what's the narrative I have going on about myself, about my life? Step three would be, is there any empowered guidance? Is there a different perspective in which I can, I can look at this situation? And then step four would be to take that empowered action or that empowered guidance. Now, step three, some people can get stuck there. Like, I don't know the empowered message, especially if they're, you know, been in this and they're kind of caught up in their story. And that's where we come in. That's that's kind of the gap that emotional empowerment fills is to support people to start priming what, what could be going on. Um, that's actually there to empower them, to give them a different perspective and to offer them choice. So again, we look at how I, how I like to say this is like, let's say there's a to-do list that we have at work or a to-do list you have at home. And you're just starting to feel very, you know, emotionally overwhelmed by that. Well, what is the exact feeling that's underneath your emotional overwhelm? Because some people, they're going to feel like sad, like they're a failure. Other people are going to feel anxious and they got to keep going. Another person might be feel guilty and they, they just can't measure up. So, and that's just three, you know, they could feel angry too, that like everything's put on them, right? So we can see we've got this to-do list. We're feeling emotionally overwhelmed, get to the more of a specific emotion because whether you're sad and feel like a failure, you're anxious um, and, and feel like you got to go, 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 you're guilty and you feel like you're not measure up or you're angry those different emotions have different guidance to support you to 
uh, to evolve in the situation and respond to it differently. So the response is very specific to you and how you are feeling about the situation because there's the opportunity where it's trying to help you see the situation differently and show up differently. So if it's anger, it's guiding you to show up differently compared to if you're feeling guilt or anxiety, et cetera. So um, really looking at what is this, uh, what am I feeling? And the more you can drill it down, the more you're going to actually be able to get into some of the, the shame that's underneath there. And that's where we can start to challenge those stories and, um, and, and, and ultimately be freed up from them. That's where we want to get you to, because anytime we're emotionally triggered, it's this subconscious wiring back from when we're seven years old, um, or it could be in our teens or in our twenties or some traumatic experience. And um, when we use our emotions as signals and as, um, and as a part of our inner GPS, this is where we have the power to, st to start rewiring those stories. And that's the opportunity where we get a less emotionally triggered and then we feel more internally freed up because we're actually processing our feelings. So interesting. I'm very, very glad we had you, Michelle. If people are curious to learn more about this, how can they connect with you or read more about this? What can they best do? Yes. Uh, so if you're interested, the best way to connect is to go to my website, which is I I e e dot training so i i e e stands for the international institute for emotional empowerment dot training um because it, i offer training in all of this so no.com um just i i e e dot training and um from there uh you can connect and uh sign up um for um blog or to learn more about other trainings that i offer Awesome. Great. And I will make sure to connect that in the show notes as well. So again, thank you so much, Michelle. This was so interesting and so fascinating and definitely a subject that I think we can always talk about and always dive deeper into because I think, you know, talk about mental health, world mental health day to day. There is obviously a lot to be said about processing emotions and looking at emotions and understanding our emotions. And I think actually your book title, Emotional Abundance, is you know, from 20 years ago, whenever you wrote that book, <laughs> I think this is actually coming back, like, you know, now is, uh, yet yeah, you were like, it was really groundbreaking stuff that you did at that time, because now, now people are really listening and now people are really paying attention to these things. And so I'm super, super excited we had you, super excited to have learned myself a little bit more about this topic as well. And if you are listening right now and you found this episode super interesting as well and you think, wow, I really need to share this with another person, a friend, a family member, a colleague, a manager, a leader um, that should really listen to this information, make sure to share this episode with them. This is the simplest, easiest way you can do to uh, help other people and to support us, Michelle and myself, in just spreading the word about the importance of emotional health, in mental health, you know, avoiding burnout, all of these important subjects that we're talking about on a weekly basis here on the podcast. So thank you so much already in advance for your support. Thank you again to Michelle for being here today and I wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Julia. It was such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.